And I'd just like to very quickly introduce our next session, which will be uh, devoted to future trends. One more uh, time, I'd like to remind everyone that we have the Q&A pane available uh, for questions. We'll be monitoring that throughout the session. And I'd like to introduce Cody Marks, our panel leader and our moderator, Joyce Lumpkin. And Cody and Joyce, would you like to uh, kick it off and introduce yourselves and the rest of the panelists? Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And again, we do appreciate you guys being here. I'm Joyce Lumpkin, and I'm going to be the moderator today of this uh, pristine panel. I have to tell you, um, we have three very astute individuals uh, who bring three very different perspectives to this distinguished topic of planning for the future and, and how things are going to impact us. So the panel is, as um, Matt suggested, was led by Cody Marks. And Cody, thank you for putting everything together. Um, I want to first introduce Hedl Bakta to you. Hedl comes um, from Ericsson, and he's their head of insurance and risk. He is an enterprise risk management professional who currently manages a comprehensive insurance program in North America for Ericsson, a leading global provider of information and communication. Heddle has served in a variety of roles prior to risk management in health and safety, environmental operations, and government relations. As he focuses on continuous improvement, he has a strong desire to learn and teach about risk management in industry. Jeff Gurchev with Corvell, he is the Vice President of Strategic Insights at Corvell. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff leads our uh, Strategic Insight team. Jeff began his career as a multi-line adjuster, claim supervisor, claim manager, and VP of claims in the TPA and IA adjusting space at Crawford, Broadspire, and Cunningham Lindsay. Jeff enhanced his knowledge and experience working for the Hartford as a Director of Workers' Compensation Claim Practices and RVP of Auto Claim Operations before making a move to the vendor side. As a vendor, Jeff has served as Vice President and General Manager for Optum's Medicare Compliance Business and President and CEO for exam works clinical solutions business. Jeff joined Corvell in December of 2019. Last but not least, we have Cody Marks, and Cody is the area vice president here in the Dallas area. Cody leads the operations for Corvell in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. He started his career in loss prevention, working for the largest work comp carrier in Minnesota, focusing on reducing injuries, helping employees return to work, and training and educating frontline workers, managers, and executives. His desire for a fast-paced role led him to the broker space with brief stints at Marsh and Arthur J. Gallagher. Since 2014, Cody has held various positions at Corvell, including sales and operational leadership for the Upper Midwest Territory prior to moving to Texas in October 2019. Today, Cody oversees roughly 150 employees, including workers' compensation claims, liability claims, medical bill review, case management, account management, and sales for his territory. Thank you guys all for being here, and we look forward to having this discussion. So, first thing we want to do is, um, again, we do invite any questions coming in from the panel or from coming in from the audience, and we'll be sure and take a look at that. Um, our first uh, questions that we would have for you would be, um, Haddle, from the uh, risk manager's perspective, let's start a conversation about what you have seen evolve over the past 20 years. It's a good one. Um, I apologize. Um, I was late to the show of joining the risk management profession. Uh, I did not get into the intern industry till seven years ago. So, but I'll give you a different example. So recently, um, uh, two weeks ago, I was involved in an automobile accident. In fact, I was rear-ended 
So I'll talk about a good experience. And uh, my experience 19 years ago, my first car accident. Uh, so in uh, 2002, I had bought a brand new car, so excited, and I got rear-ended. And I still remember the saga, having to go from body shop to body shop, sending mail documents, trying to email people. Some people didn't have email. Uh, the process of getting a rear end accident settled took me months and I felt like it took a year. In fact, I actually have a file and I still kept all the documents. I, I, for some reason I kept it all, but it was a process. And recently when I had my accident two weeks ago where I got rear ended, I got the information, called the insurance company. Hey, Mr. Barta, we're waiting for your call. Collected my information. They said within 48 hours, someone will be contacting you. An adjuster called me in 48 hours, said, hey, do you have 15 minutes? I need you to uh, walk through you with uh, two questions and get some pictures from you. I took some pictures from my phone, text it to them, and next thing you know, I get an email saying your check will be sent and everything is ready to go for me to go to a body shop and get it repaired. So the, the process has changed. Um, you know, we talked about earlier today, there was a lot of communication, how technology has advanced. Um, but that, that's, that, that adds to what this whole risk management experience is for employees uh, from work comp claims to um, auto liability claims that uh, we work with, what claims were managed or how they were managed from 20 years ago to how they were managed now is about efficiency, um, more customer care, and getting to the people to the way they want. Um, I, my total time spent on my work comp, or sorry, my automobile, automobile liability claim has been less than 25 minutes right now. That's it. And I spent six months in the prior. I spent 25 minutes so far. I still have the body shop to go, but that's progress. 25 minutes to manage an automobile claim. That is fantastic. So that's my little, uh, you know, conversation about how technology to me has evolved over the last 20 years, um, not just as a risk manager, but from a employee perspective or a, uh, a person that's a victim of an accident. <laughs> That is, you know what, Every, I think everybody has life experiences that come back into what you do each and every day. So I think that's a great example of the life experiences that you've lived. Uh, Jeff, do you have um, things that you would maybe add to that or a different perspective on how the claims and risk industries evolved in the last 20 years? You've certainly served in different roles. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've served in a few. Um... Heddle's uh, example is a great one because I too had a similar example of him with uh, a roof claim, a hail damage claim on my roof and my roofer came out and took some photographs and the long story of this is I never saw the insurance adjuster even come to my house. They took the measurements from satellite pictures. They did the estimation through estimating software and my claim was settled at, at an ACV initially and then RCV when we completed the repairs within a couple of weeks time, which was just an amazing process of how things um, have evolved. But my, my take and, and my perspective might be a little bit different from Heddle's in that I've got more gray hair than he does. And, and I think uh, Cody does as well that I've been in this business for more than years and a couple of the things that I've seen evolve in the in the claims aspect is first claim specialization. When I started in this business, claim specialization was rare. If you were in the IA and the TPA space, you were heavily involved in servicing the account and servicing the account directly from the standpoint of if it was an auto claim, you handled it. If it was a GL claim, you handled it. If it was a workers' comp claim, you handled it. So there was account specialization, but not product or claim specialization as much as we see today. What we see today, of course, is very specialized claim professionals. You're an auto adjuster, you're a GL adjuster, you're a property adjuster, you're a workers comp adjuster. And it doesn't even go that far. It goes further in that you specialize within the specialization. So if you look at an automobile adjuster, they may handle just PIP, or maybe they handle auto physical damage and collision claims, or maybe they handle just property damage claims or the bodily injury claims. The same goes for workers' comp. You may be an MO adjuster, maybe you're a resolution adjuster, maybe you're an indemnity adjuster. So we've seen a, a whole lot of shift and change from that specialization piece within the industry in the, the past 30 years. The other thing that as I think back is face-to-face -face interactions have changed a whole heck of a lot in 
in this space and adjusting claims. When I started in this business, technology isn't nearly what it is today. You may have had a beeper. You didn't have a cell phone and you didn't have access to email like you have today. A lot of the interactions that we had at that point was a phone call to a claimant or an insured and say, I'll see you on at Tuesday at 3 p.m. And we'll sit down and we'll have a conversation as to what's transpired and you can walk me through the paces. That's changed a whole heck of a lot. Now, what will be interesting with the advent of doing things more virtually like we're doing today is, does some of that come back, you know, as to how we adjust claims is more going to be face to face virtually uh, as opposed to physically. We will see. The other thing is um, technology. I, I think claims as a whole has been slow to adopt technology, but electronic claim files versus paper files. When I started, it was a paper file. You took your notes on the side, you divided your paper file into different section if it was workers comp. It was very different than it is today. The electronic files that we have, email and the scanning of mail. I remember the days of adjusters that would hide mail in the desk so that their supervisor or manager couldn't find it. Uh, today, that, that can't exist, right? Because everything comes in, it gets scanned, there's immediate information and, and access to that. And the last thing is just how we work. Um, back when I started again, it was always in an office. It was always in a suit and tie. You know, you see all of us today are not even in a suit and tie today. It was in a suit and tie. I said to sit at my desk with my suit and tie on. I climbed roofs with my suit and tie on. So that's how things have changed. People didn't have cubes. We sat in big bullpen areas as adjusters with big metal desks and we could hear everybody else's conversations. Things have changed a whole heck of a lot in our work environments because today, as we've seen, a lot of folks now work remotely out of their homes. They aren't coming into offices. Um, so just a few things as I've seen, you know, how the, the industry and the claims business has changed over the years. I can certainly agree with you on that because I do remember um, working in a very different environment indeed. And um, I think we're going to see even more changes on the next six months with everything that's been going on. So, uh, Cody, you certainly bring a different um, perspective to what's been happening in the industry over the past 20 years. Um, I think that lends probably a lot to your father and him coming yeah. and him being a part of it. So. What is your perspective? Yeah, totally. And that, that's why I really got in the business. My dad was actually injured in an occupational accident before I was born. So I saw really the ramifications of his health care and his return to work and or lack of, of lack of work back in the in the 80s and, and 90s. So that really got me thinking about what I want to do with my career and how I could help out injured workers, uh, prevent injury on the front end and then post accident, how to work with strategies to get people back to work while working with executives and really have a, a, a passion for for that piece of the business. And that's a, that's a big thing for me. Um, a few memories for me that come back to when I first started my career. And as I think about where technology was back maybe in the year 2000 and just coming out of high school at that point, it, there was just a unique approach, I think, and a different lifestyle than what we have today. I got my first cell phone. Uh, as a senior in high school, I'm just thinking about the functionality of that phone itself was just straight out of the Stone Age compared to what we have today. I can play uh, really no games on there with the exception of maybe one or two. And you think about what the phone can do today from a search engine standpoint to all of the above. Speaking of search engine, my search engine of choice back in uh, you know, 20 years ago was, was Yahoo or Hotbot. Hotbot. There was a little known company called Google that really hadn't hit the market yet. They were out there, but the ability to Google things, that wasn't even a term. And by, by 04, when I was in, in college, um, the, first, the first time we could access Facebook, it wasn't an interconnected uh, environment or social platform as it is today. It was just an online directory of you know, college kids within your same college. It's the only way you could get to Facebook. And that's how it first started with, you know, people in your class and figuring out who their friends were. And that, all that has just really evolved and changed. And, um, you know, by the time I started my career with uh, the State Fund Mutual of Minnesota, uh, in about 2007, the iPhone had launched. And it wasn't that it was a phone. It was the first true device, the interconnectivity of that device from, 
not just text messaging and um, being able to make a phone call, but all the application that went into it. It was your social media. You, you could take pictures. It was, you name it. Um, it was so cool at that particular per, uh, period of time to have a device such as that. Um, and I would think that that interconnectedness is really what has evolved in the claim space in the risk industry. Um, the devices we carry, how we communicate with each other. We've moved, as Gertz talked about, we've moved away from the pen and paper claims process that um, maybe uh, you started with, with in your career to just a highly complex and integrated model that creates rapid communication across the board, real-time decision-making, and the overall better claim results have, that have transpired from it. So I'd say the biggest thing is the, the ability to communicate, not just through email, but through systems and uh, technology, and the speed of which that we can get things done today has allowed us to make better decisions and really change the industry in the past 20 years. I, I can absolutely appreciate all of that because I can remember my early times at my corporate systems days when everything was DOS and Lotus Notes. And those two terms aren't even spoke, spoken today, right? So with that, yeah, lots of folks are giggling or they're saying, I remember when. Um, with that, what would you guys say has been the biggest innovation? Then over the last 20 years, because you guys have thrown out several different ideas, different perspective, but perhaps what's the one biggest innovation you've seen, Cody? Yeah, I, I would say um, when I was first at uh, the State Fund in Minnesota, there, there was no such thing as 24-7 triage or uh, immediate intervention of telehealth would go on and from a comp perspective say that's been really the biggest innovation is the the immediate intake of claims, uh, the immediate access of care of the injured worker and the advent of telehealth to keep injured workers at the job. And I just think about the access in general, the access to care. Um, you know, for the example, if I've heard on the job and maybe I work for Ericsson and I'm placing cell towers across the country in remote locations. Um, how am I going to get in front of a provider? Well, today we have immediate access to treatment and care. It's got to be non-catastrophic, of course, to get in front of that nurse or in front of that immediate tele telehealth doctor. But just the ability uh, to be anywhere, whether it's downtown Dallas or in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa or the upper Midwest, you have the ability to have that discussion with a nurse and, you know, uh, versus having to drive to a brick and mortar facility and stay on the job. Um, I think it brings just a level of peace of mind to the injured workers and their customers because people, when they're hurt on the job, there's a level of fear, uncertainty, and in many cases, anxiety. And I think that process has really driven um, better outcomes, uh, decreased litigation, as well as better reporting uh, and with, with, with an injury on the job. I say that that's been, from my experience in this space, in the past 15 years of being in the work environment um, is the, the advent of 24-7 triage of telehealth. Okay. Well, had old Cody teed you up there with the Ericsson, and Ericsson has absolutely <laughs> been innovative. And um, um, so what, what's been your biggest innovation that you've seen? Well, uh, first of all, I'll say, Cody, that first phone must have been an Ericsson Sony phone. Um, oh, second, oh, um, <laughs> thank you for copying my notes here, exactly what I was going to talk about telehealth. But I, I want to talk about two aspects. Um, I know this forum, uh, we've, we've got a symposium, we've discussed uh, email digitization and the you know mobile phones changing the way we do work. But it is, it is ties to telehealth. And, um, you know, just from an employer's perspective, you, you see a different, you know, a way to can we help our employees connect. Um, Take ourselves, uh, we show up at a job site, if someone's injured, uh, we have an EHS professional or a risk professional helping an employee, but the employee's like, well, who are you to tell me what I need? So instead of, uh, you know, instead of waiting to get to a doctor's office or trying to figure out what the nearest location is, we could have a quick telehealth call and helping the employee get the care they need. And that's the trust that creates the bond that helps uh, not only it helps the uh, case manager on the claim, it helps the employer, and it ultimately helps the employee. 
it helps them get back to work, have full trust in the process that, hey, they cared about me day one, minute number one. And that's essential for us uh, in our industry is getting them the correct health or correct, uh, correct attention timely. Um, and then telehealth has been a big, big movement for Ericsson over the last uh, 18 months. And we're definitely seeing the fruits of the labor there because uh, more and more employees, we ask them, hey, would you like to do this? And more and more say, yes, I want to do telehealth first. And that, that's, that, that's the volume that speaks for itself. So we're definitely excited um, The telehealth technology has uh, taken off. I know it's been around for four or five years, but I think uh, COVID has allowed it to see the true potential benefit that the program does offer. Um, the second aspect that I will talk about, um, but in biggest innovation has happened in the last 20 years is telematics. Uh, when it comes to the fleet side of uh, businesses, uh, we're seeing telematics being employed numerous, numerous ways um, from the technology, from braking systems to turn signals um, in, in, in different manners to help track if an employee is speeding or not speeding. So you could do a lot of proactive coaching. You could prevent accidents from happening. And that technology has really helped the industry, even though it's a tough market right now in the auto industry. Um, it, it's definitely helping to keep our employees safe in the work field. Um, so that's the other venue that I talk about. Uh, it's have I entered in two innovations, but between telehealth and um, telemedicine, or sorry, telehealth and telematics, uh, the combination has uh, definitely been great innovations, which have helped uh, companies like Ericsson and others to succeed in going into the next ten years. Okay. Well, Jeff, maybe with you, a little bit of your auto background, um, you could, uh, you might agree with telematics, but you might also think that there's something else in the last 20 years that's really come out. What yeah, data, think? data, 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 and, and data that has stemmed from the innovation part of computerized claim files, computerized claim notes, electronic mail, OCR technology, and all that eventually becomes information. And the ability to collect information, the ability to show and display information to customers, prospects of what's happening within the claims environment, within their claim files, comparing how they're, they're trending with their particular results uh, compared to others in the same industry industry or within Corvell's book. So the, the access to data has, to me, been the, the biggest innovation. And that came from, again, the, the computerization, the digitization of all sorts of different things over the, the past several years. The virtual care, uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, virtual or telemedicine, 24-7 triage, as Cody discussed, have been critically important in this um, evolution and, and advances in innovation. And the last thing I had from a note standpoint was just estimating software. At the beginning, both uh, Heddle and I discussed having claims where that process was incredibly fast. And the ability for now the, the claims world to use Estimating software that is very smart, if you will, uh, becomes and accelerates the whole process for everyone involved, claimant, insured, et cetera. Well, I, I agree with you. I think data has always been a driver in the claims industry and everybody's, you know, starting to figure out new and innovative ways to use data. Um, so I think that leads us to our next topic and Heddle, do you want to talk a little bit about how you, you guys are using data today? Because I think it's very important in, you know, your industry, but it's also important to claims. Absolutely. And um, I, I will say I, I had an opportunity to speak with an executive of a, um, um, a major brokerage firm, and I asked the same question, what get his thoughts on this? And um, it coincides with my thoughts. It's uh, we've come a long way with data. Um, we've advanced a lot in the last 20 years. We have more data available. We can do more with it, but it's been taking the time to do something with it. Um, I think a lot of uh, risk managers are overwhelmed with uh, everything that they're managing, that they're not taking advantage of the data. And we look to our peers to help us with that. For example, Corvell has recently um, helped me put together uh, charts and diagrams to help me share with our EHS department our environmental health and safety group on here's what we're trending. Here's what we're seeing from the work comp side, you know, and uh, we're trying to make sure that our data is aligned to their goals. 
because if they are working on the areas that we're seeing claims, that helps us to prevent them in the future through their programs, it's a win-win. So that's where data is being deployed in Ericsson and other organizations. But I think um, we still have a long way to go uh, to take that time to use more of that data. Um, similar to in the fleet side, we're, we're working now on um, what type of accident it was. Was it a preventable accident? Was it uh, our fault? Um, we're taking the data and then we're assigning courses to employees to educate them doing behavioral based training to help them understand what they can do better next time. So these are the aspects of taking data and doing something with it. Um, companies are becoming more and more mature, um, but they, they, they still have some time to go because it's making the time for it. Um, we're slowly evolving and I hope uh, others are evolving just as um, you know, faster than us, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, I agree. Um, Jeff, you are certainly one of our data experts at uh, Corvell. And so what, what, how are you using it? What are you doing to um, really bring light to uh, strategic topics or um, thresholds or direction for some of our clients? Yeah, thanks, Joyce. Um, uh, Hedel touched on a, a few other things that and so I lead our what we call our strategic insights management team and our strategic insights management team is actually supposed to be con consultative for our customers and taking that that data um, data, not just from our customer, but data from the marketplace data from books of business data from other industry studies comp completed by NCCI or WCRI or CWCC or you name the, you know, the alphabet. Um, area, but we're taking all that information and we're trying to distill that for our customers to put it into something very actionable. Heddle said, you know, risk management folks have a thousand things coming at them and it's coming from all sorts of different directions. So our team of strategic insights is actually to help take all that information, put it into some usable format and provide consultation to our customers. This is what we see. And the what we see can be simple things from a root cause analysis perspective, and not just that somebody slipped, tripped and fell perhaps someplace, but what actually caused the slip, trip and fall and what locations or in what jurisdictions or venues are we seeing the frequency and, and how can we then put safety programs or other controls in place to, to impact those types of things. Predictive analytics is a big part of how we're also using the data. How do you better project what claims may ultimately have the highest probability of becoming litigated? And how do you avoid you know, the litigation that could ensue? So platforms using data to identify claims that are have a high likelihood to be litigated and how do you get in front of that to stop it? Because we know a litigated case has much higher average incurred, total incurred than a claim that's generally not litigated. So we're using some of those predictive tools, severity tools from a predictive standpoint, what claims are more likely to be outliers, you know, that back strain that creeps, you know, and we've all seen that in the workers' comp space that the back strain that then becomes spinal fusion surgery that then creeps to the knee and before you know, you thought you had a $7,500 claim that ends up $200,000 claim. So how can you use data and predictive analytics to get in front of that, identify those cases? And that's part of how we're using it. Um, and then, you know, performance analysis goes without saying, KPIs and, and things such as that, that we help uh, not only our customers measure their performance, but also help measure how we internally at Corvell are, are performing. And the last piece, which is really important, is, is machine learning. And how do we, we take all this data and allow machines to learn and update and upgrade how we do it, which I think is really cool as we think about what may happen in, in 2030 and beyond and how our, our industry looks like or looks from a claims perspective. I agree. I agree with you on all of those aspects. Um, but do you know what? I, I think there's probably some gaps in certain areas in data. Cody, do you, I'm going to ask you, um, is there a gap in data or what do you see? There, there, sure, there, yeah, oh, definitely. And sometimes when we take over a program, we might have a historical tale going back 30, 40, 50 years, depending on the complexity of the program. So the data that we have, you know, that might come from a takeover file 
it needs to be scrubbed. We need to reevaluate it in a lot of cases and make sure that we have the appropriate fields. And in some certain cases, I think all TPAs would, would agree with this, is sometimes you just have to fill in the gaps on your own. And when you fill in the gaps, there can be errors. Um, so from, from a presentation standpoint, and to, I think Heddle said it best, and Gertz even alluded to it, Heddle's probably working on 10 different projects uh, throughout the course of the day. So um, how do we fill in the gaps for the risk manager? Well, we have to be really proactive from an account management standpoint to provide the information. Yeah, we might have beautiful screens and tools and analytics and dashboards, but without some consultative engagement, that data, that story, it doesn't mean anything. So as we evolve and how do we project out and by 2030, if we're gonna be able to make those those changes is gonna really come through artificial intelligence, prescriptive, those are all buzzwords, yes, but it is capitalizing on the data that is available and using new data to supplement some of the old data to ensure that our, that our projections and our prescript, prescribed outcomes um, ultimately help injured workers, help risk managers make better decisions. Okay, you've all talked a lot about different buzzwords in the industry, different um, machine learning, uh, virtual, everything that's happening virtually, but take a little crystal ball and um, why don't you, Heddle, why don't you tell me what you project or how you project technology to impact your program in 2020, 2030? I guess we're at 2020, so it's got to be 2030, yeah. right? There you go. No, I, I think there's um, an immense opportunity in technology, and uh, Erickson, uh, you know, desires to be in the forefront of that. Um, I mean, I'm taking simple stuff from wearable devices, taking your Apple Watches to expanding that to your body. We're looking at how do you posture your body to lift something. If you're lifting it in an awkward position, it vibrates, tells you, hey, stop. You got to change um, to mm. glasses. Uh, we're looking at uh, glass wearable technology that on one side you're looking, but the other side is a TV screen where you can see a PDF so you can do your job precisely. Uh, do it, uh, you know, if you need to read some instructions, you can pull it up from there from voice command. So it's, it's, it's about innovation. Um, Ericsson's looking at automated vehicles to transport their equipment to one side to another to drone usage, um, helping to get work done assisting to help get work done or measurement. So the, the technology in 10 years is going to be highly part and on the proactive side of things. And what this results in is de decrease in claims and eventually you know, helping us to get to that next level. And this, ha this is all going to be part of data. The data that we're collecting now helps lead us to where technology will be in 10 years. And it's so essential that we talk about you know, um, Jeff alluded to the data has evolved in 10 years um, over the last 20 years. But I think the data that we're going to be collecting in the next five years based on current technology is going to help propel us for the next 10 years. And that's what the success is going to be. How do companies that are in this tech field take advantage of that? So that's kind of what I'm kind of most excited about of uh, what the changes or the perspires I mean for the 2030 from a technology standpoint. So, Heddle, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the watches. I know that we hear a lot of pushback about Big Brother. Do you yep. think that people are going to push back on that and say, no, I don't want Big Brother watching me on my arm? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you'll, have a, you'll have an audience. So, we've, we've done some pilot programs and various type of things. Uh, we've taken 60, 70 people who we'll have 10 or 12 that, hey, I do not want to participate in that. But then the uh, 60, 70 that did, uh, the 60 left over that did participate, see the benefit of it. And as we take the learnings from the benefit, we can mm -hmm. educate the 10% that struggle with it and also take the learnings and implement better processes and procedures. So it's about taking the big brother concept and taking it into a positive attribute. It's about what you do with the negativity. You don't sit there and ignore it. You do something about it. You use the data to demonstrate to them. You take the data and implement best practices that benefits everyone. So that's kind of where I would uh, take that approach, and that's where Ericsson has stood. Um, it, it, it knows that uh, there's always going to be something out there. 
but it's about using the positivity of the opportunity to help, uh, you know, lessen the load of the negativity that's out in the field. I agree. Um, I think that's absolutely, you, you have to take, um, constructive pushback and you have to do something with it and keep moving you have to forward. Listen to it. It's so important to listen to it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. So, Jeff, uh, how do you project technology to impact your program in 2030? Yeah, I, I have some of the same thoughts that, that Heddle did. Um, uh, my, my notes here, first and foremost, say claim frequency is, you know, if we think about just claims in general, I, I see claim frequency continuing to decline uh, in the, the auto space. We've talked about automated cars um, and it's while it's new and there's their technology challenges, it's going to evolve. Automated cars are going to become more commonplace and not just scanning the road as to what's in front of them or what's next to them, but also maybe talking to the cars next to them as well so that they're all talking to each other. So as that evolves and more and more people have automation from a car standpoint, I think we're going to see a significant change in, in auto claim frequency. The interesting question will become, I think, in the auto space, though, is as that technology evolves and an accident ensues now who's liable for said accident is it the occupant of the vehicle or the owner of the vehicle or does it start to fall back on the manufacturer of the vehicles is it a products liability case of some sort that they get dragged into you know the, the litigation that may ensue uh, particularly if the person that owns the car isn't in control of said car. So I, I think there's there's some interesting dynamics that may happen on the auto side. And on the work comp side, Heddle hit it right on the head. You know, the wearable technology, I think, will have a profound impact on claim frequency of alerting, as he said, vibrations to the employee, alerting them that they're bending, lifting, pulling in a way perhaps they, that they shouldn't be doing. And those things can be then overcome. I, you know, it's funny that you bring up the automation in uh, transportation because I was at a uh, transportation conference right before COVID came about and we actually were able to tour a, a truck that was coming out for Walmart and they, it was literally the driver was sitting almost in a cockpit like an airplane and he had digital panels all beside him and he was sitting in the very middle of the truck. So it was an, an entirely different concept and everything was electronic. So it, I just, I sat there and I thought, I can't even imagine trying to operate that truck and do that, but that's where it's going, right? So um, Cody, so you're, you're over the operations. You are, um, you know, probably giddy with some technology that could probably come your way to help. But what's the biggest up, um, impact you see for 2030? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And, and Joyce, I think you're describing the Tesla truck, actually. Um, it is very possible because I do know that they put the captain's chair right in the middle and the technology around. They call it the safest uh, truck uh, on the market today. And I think the range of it is only about 250 to 400 miles. But significantly different than what you might get from a gasoline vehicle. But at the same time, that's that's the wave of the future. Um, I could go in a couple different directions with your question. Um, I'll start with maybe the process side. And I think there's one more question after this. And I think that's more on the human and talent, talent side, so I'll let you ask that. But um, I, I would say that, you know, had both Heddle and Gerch, Jeff, alluded to this is that the impact of AI machine learning and I believe the internet of things in 2030 it just it, the impact just can't be understated the internet of things is everything from your connected wearable to your home your business I assume implantables by 2030 will be popular amongst uh, younger generations and maybe in older generations the self-driving vehicles and that's going to have a significant impact on claims uh, the drone, the instantaneous data sharing, the instantaneous messaging and alerts that Heddle talked about, just the wearable within the clothes, if you're bending inappropriately, is the employee fatigue, real-time alerts, real-time coaching, real-time prevention that will ultimately drive down, uh, I think, claims made um, in the next couple of years. 
And I, I really think of this industry in general and will it be upended? Um, think about today's giants like Netflix, it's barely 20 years old or Uber for that example is, le is less than 10 years old. What is the next innovation? Will it come in the insurance space? Will Amazon jump into our space and wipe out the industry as we know it? I think those are questions that we need to prepare for um, as companies want to survive, obviously, um, their intellectual prop property, their intellectual capital is probably the most important thing that they have. But in order to thrive, they need to have an agile culture and an operating model that will really allow them to be cutting edge and on the innovation to just keep pace with the radical change that's, that's happening. And I think the E at the end of change now is just you can just make that evolve. It, we all need to evolve personally, professionally, businesses, and otherwise um, we may go the way of Blockbuster. So I, I would project out it's the internet of things, it's the connectivity and the ability to make decisions based on immediate alerts and immediate alert preferences uh, going forward. I agree. I, um, I think that there's we're all faced with change, right? And I think change happens to be one of the hardest thing any individual has to adapt to, right? And, and look, for, look at and process through. So, Heddle, if I, if I could have you zero in on claims and the risk and insurance industry, what do you think the biggest innovation will be for 2030? I think it uh, kind of uh, adds the E that uh, uh, Cody just talked about, but uh, my E probably uh, is probably more tied to Ericsson. Um, but it is connectivity. It's um, you're you're living the life right now. It's 5G. Um, you're you're hearing about technology and um, what does that mean? So it's about latency. It's about how fast you connect and get your information. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see. We talked about IoT. We talked about having uh, connectivity, having information, having things be automated. Well, nothing's possible if you don't have the infrastructure to move all that data, to move um, the information from one place to another. And that's gonna lead to increased speed in claims, in increase in productivity of work. It's gonna help us as risk managers doing renewals to move data. You know, we're getting to a market space where we, it takes us months to get a quote together. Well, once we have connectivity, better data, all the combination of it, we're going to have quotes within a week, within a couple of days. So the connectivity speed of things that's going to be coming up, you know, back in the days uh, we talked about 20 years ago, is that dan 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 noise to get connected. Um, you get to wait till that signal kind of finally goes through. Oh, I'm connected now. Well, now in the future, in 10 years from now, you're going to get information so fast. It's about your mind can it react as fast as what you're getting it. So I think that's the evolution that uh, the innovation that's going to help our industry is how fast we get information, how fast we're going to have to move. And that's going to change the way we're going to have to think about it. We're not going to have to manage. We're going to manage claims differently in the future to keep up with the speed that things come through. So we're going to have to evolve to the speed that's going to be out there in 10 years. And that's something for us to all think about. Um, I know Cody mentioned that you know other companies will take interest in this industry. Well, at the same time, we're going to have to adapt. So not only do they take interest, or we're there to be a part of it. That's actually a really good point. As you see uh, other companies take interest in doing things differently or entering this industry to make a change or make a difference, I, I do think that's a great point that you make because. We're going to, things are going to happen that none of us could even foresee happening. Um, so, Jeff, and Jeff, you have to uh, have to tell you, I am like holding back trying to not call you your nickname. So <laughs> I Go for it. It's, it's quite that. fine. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so from the claims and the risk and insurance industry, what, what is the biggest innovation that you think is going to come? Yeah, I think a couple things. One, um, what I've, what I would call dynamic claim practices. So machine learning is is doing an incredible job of really telling us that not every claim, even though it's classified the same, is the same. And 
the the vision is that ultimately your claim practices won't be static but they will be continuously evolving that the machine the computers will help guide the adjuster as to what claims they need to touch with what frequency they need to touch those particular claims and how they touch those claims that will impact the results the most there are some claims that perhaps we don't want to admit that aren't impacted by by human touch all that much they may be some of the exception, but does it make sense to spend the time on those? Probably not. How do you spend those, your time, focus your resources on those claims at the right time? And you can use machine learning and dynamic claim practices in, in doing that. So I think we will see an evolution because of machine learning of dynamic claim practices that the system will guide when you're supposed to follow up as opposed to a, a written document that says you need to do this at seven days and you need to do this by 30 days, that the system will help guide that and it will lead to improved outcomes. I think claim automation is gonna to continue to evolve as well. There are certain tasks today that we all do in the claims environment that ultimately could be replaced. And not to say that we're, we're all gonna lose our jobs one day, but there are certain tasks that will, that are very repeatable, that could be automated, that aren't automated today. So I see that as a continuous evolution in, in the claim process, particularly as we're expected to handle things quicker and quicker as, as Heddle uh, described. And then I think there's, there's ultimately a, perhaps even a new position born in, in the claims world um, because of claim automation and because of dynamic claim practices where perhaps some of our adjusters as we know them today become more of stewards, claims automation managers, that they're watching the outcomes of some claim automation as to if they need to engage or not engage. So I think there's there's some new positions that may be born out of as automation expands, there still has to be somebody to watch over those those claims and 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 how they evolve. I, I think that's actually um, something that's an interesting concept and I have seen a lot of companies out there uh, who are trying to automate everything, right, whether it be formularies or uh, through processing on the PDM or, you know, uh, taking the human touch out of the front end on the claims processing. So, Cody, I'm going to ask you actually a couple of different questions here. Do you okay. see the human, do you see the human touch coming out of claims? I think you've just teed me up perfectly, Joyce. Um, I think the human touch is always going to be a component of the claim process. The human element is incredibly important, and I think that's going to be one of the biggest innovations uh, still by 2030. We talked a lot today about process and technology, but we just haven't talked about people. And I think access to talent is going to be the, one of the biggest innovations, not just in our industry, but across the board as hiring, hiring managers are always looking for good people to, to fill important positions. I think the term flexibility already has new meaning in how we work, but it's going to even evolve even more so by 2030. And as we hire for our operation just right here in Dallas, we want to bring in the, the brightest and the the Bryce Minds and I'd say the top talent across the board and in our new COVID and soon to be post COVID world, I don't as a hiring manager necessarily care where the worker lives. If they live in Dallas, great. Could they live in New York or California or Florida? I'm not sure it matters. And as long as we have core business hours that align with our operational uh, needs and our customer needs, we can we can make that work. I think about some of like the millennials or, or the generation that's just coming out of high school and out of college, a lot of them want to travel. And if they were able to connect with maybe Ericsson's 5G network or, uh, um, you know, that balloons that are popping up all over the world, um, that's going to give us a better opportunity to hire good people. And they can maybe do their job from Zion National Park and then the next week from uh, Yosemite. It, it just doesn't matter. So. Access to global talent, I think, is another component, not just access to talent, but by 2030, I would think that there's going to be more opportunity for us to even tear down some international borders. If you think about um, 
all the genius in the world that we have today. Um, there's, there's, if you're born with incredible talents and uh, the chances of you using those talents may not exist today or may not have existed in the past. And I've been doing some reading on um, a guy by the name of Peter Diamandis. He's got a great blog. He states that while IQ isn't the only measure of genius, the standard distribution of the Stanford Binet scale shows that about 1% of our population qualifies as genius. And technically that makes up about 79 million people in the world of a 7.9 billion um, population. And how do we get an immediate, for those individuals that are not connected? Um, in the 2030s, I think in our hyper-connected world with the 5G, with the satellite networks, we're gonna be able to bring on more minds to the web than ever before. That is just gonna unlock the floodgates of human capital. It's gonna create new opportunities, new decisions, new leadership styles, new products, new services. It's anyone's guess, but that human component, I think whether it's virtual or in person is gonna still be a significant contributor to the claims world. That is something that I think that all companies need to keep in mind is how do you keep your human uh, and staff? As we all know, the um, insurance industry is growing older. There's a few mm -hmm. of us that, you know, could potentially retire in the next, you know, several years. So, uh, you know, it's bringing in new talent and it's figuring out how to get um, people interested in the industry. So I, I agree with, couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you guys have answered a, a lot of great questions today. You've, you've talked about the innovation. Um, I know that I'm, I'm very happy that Corvell has uh, partnered with Ericsson because, you know, we absolutely want to keep things moving and keep the data going back and forth. So uh, Ericsson is absolutely, um, you know, helping us and um, working with us on connectivity with the 5G across the U.S. So that's awesome. Um, I do not see any questions that have come in from the panel or from the uh, audience today. So is there any other thoughts or any other perspectives that the three, any of the three of you would like to add? Sure, I would just say that growth mindset is incredibly important. And whether you're an employee or a company, always thinking about always thinking and always growing and making sure that you're up to speed with technology there is going to be an increased demand for talented people that understand new technologies and there never will be a substitute for uh, long-term customer engagement and customer experience i think on the machine level it has to come from the human element so how you evolve as a, as a person and as a you know, a business associate or as a professional really should be centered around growth, education, and finding out what's next, what's going to be relevant in the next three to five years. And from a business standpoint, um, I think businesses will just have to continually transform. Even, you know, pursuing small think tanks or small groups embedded within their company to evolve with the products, to evolve with the time, to bring new products to market that hit the market that have an immediate impact. Otherwise, growth will be stagnant. And, you know, I alluded to Blockbuster before, but, you know, Netflix gobbled up Blockbuster in just a couple of years. And you just, to, to remain relevant, have, least have to be thinking about what's around the corner. Cody, it's kind of funny you mentioned uh, Blockbuster. My son just uh, grabbed a DVD he was showing me and he's like, Dad, you bought this from Blockbuster. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> so uh, funny you mentioned. But it, it's along the same line. My my last comment: it um, the, the people side is extremely important. Um, you know, from a risk management perspective, uh, everything we do it's continuous improvement. How do you get better? How do you get better growth? Grow from technology, grow from uh, innovation. But at the end of the day, everything has to have a personal touch. And uh, the, the humanist side of it is uh, where our industry is at. That's what's helped our industry to be where it's at today. And to some fashion, yes, there may be some minor automated claims that go through without needing human interaction. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, there's going to be a continued need for growth and uh, the right people to come into the industry to help us uh, keep that evolving and have that communication 
from a humanistic standpoint. So I definitely agree with you there. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish up with agreeing with the two of you. You you couldn't have said it better. Um, that I, I also just for our audience embrace it. It's it's here. It's going to continue to evolve. What what's happening from a technology, a claim, a risk perspective, and it's it's not something to be afraid of. It's something to embrace and figure out how how you can incorporate those changes into what you do in the, in the marketplace and and capitalize on it. So. Um, thank you for you know, the, the pleasure of, of being on this panel with, with everybody. I've really enjoyed it. Likewise. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you. I have to tell you, you guys, um, I think, made a great panel. And thank you for all of the input that you've given. Um, I think that this conference itself is a um, testament as to the changes that have happened over the year. Whoever would have thought that we would be having so many virtual meetings in front of our laptops or sitting here. So um, things have changed and they're going to continue to change. So thank you all. Thank you to all of the audience for participating today. Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Joyce. And thank you, Heddle, Jeff, and Cody for your thoughts today and Joyce for moderating this excellent panel. One quick fact check. Uh, Blockbuster does still exist. There's one last Blockbuster here in my state of Oregon in the beautiful city of Bend. I think you can watch a documentary about it on Netflix, which is very ironic because I think that Netflix was offered to but, uh, offered to sell the Blockbuster for some measly sum that, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago or something like that. But anyway, I um, really enjoyed your presentation. I enjoyed all the panels today and to all of our attendees. I hope you did too. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation and their attendance today. I would especially like to thank Carly Eastwood for organizing the symposium. I'd like to thank all of our panelists who participated today. And I'd especially like to thank you, our audience, for your attendance. Uh, we hope that you got something out of the uh, sessions today. And uh, we look forward to meeting up with you again, uh, hopefully in person one of these days. Carly, is there anything else that you would like to add? Oh, just thank you again to everyone. Matt, you made me tear up, so thank you so much. This was a labor of love. Everyone who was on a panel, led a panel, and worked with me for the last year and a half almost in getting this up and running. We appreciate you and everyone who attended. I can say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you from Corvell. We love our clients. We love our potential clients. And if you ever need us, we're here for you. Partners in progress all the way. <laughs>